the last video, we emulated the code execution of the first 15 commands and finally got to know a possibility to view the interactive ASCII function graph. On the one hand, it became clear if we emulate instruction, it would be nice if the stack as well as the registers are changed automatically. And on the other hand, the function graph simplifies the structural analysis considerably. We switch to the mini view and see up here in the screen 6 add sign. That is the code block in which we are currently. On the left we see the rest of the content and we can now follow with T the green path as already discussed and with F the red path. Follow a blue path with T or jump directly to certain code blocks with G and the following character. We follow the red path to 1031 and try to follow the green path to 223C and see that we are on in the interrupt function. Here we go back and follow the red path. Again, the green path are back in the interrupt function. Go back again. Red path, green path, interrupt. Red path, green path, interrupt. Go back. Red path, green path. This time we came out somewhere else. We are in function hex 42328. From there we can follow the green path to the interrupt function again. Go back twice. And follow the red path. And from here we can follow the green path and land at 231A. Or the red path and land at 231E but over 22F9. Well, that's not too exciting so we go on to see what's happening there. Because that's the only point while we do not come to the interrupt function 2237, if we follow the red path, we come to this function 236E, and then comes an exciting feature almost at the end. Here we see a loop. Because if we follow the green path, we are back at the beginning of 42387. As often as we follow the green path, the code block is executed. What exactly will be done we will see. We follow the red path and reach the end of the code. This is described by call ECX. Then there are signs which we will look at immediately. Interesting here is that a dynamic call depending on the register ECX is executed. Exactly what ECX stands for we have to look at in detail and have to follow the code until then. But it will be very exciting again. Let's take a look at what this at byte eax al means and change to this mode. And see that there is no code or 5 bytes with 0 followed by f25 and so on and so forth. This is not well displayed here because he thinks he would have the function 00ff and then the function that would be the correct syntax. That's not quite true, so we go down there. I can show you that this is the correct syntax and here at the point C4 a jump is made to the address which is deposited at address 402430. So here seems to be the end of the code because here we were before. So that actually with call ECX the code execution is finished. Hmm, that's very interesting. The first 15 commands were manually evaluated and we will continue to emulate the registers and stack changes without actually executing the code. To do this we initialize a virtual machine in Radare2 by using the command AE, A for analysis and E for emulate, AEI for initialize ezeal virtual machine state. AEIN for ESIL virtual stack and the program counter with AEIP. Now we see above in this area is the stack. 
here are the different registers and the stack pointer is also set to this value here. Let's go through it again for a moment. With S we can perform one emulated debugger step. We push EBP on the stack, we push ESP on the stack, pop EBP from the stack again, move 445ED to EAX, subtract hex 30 from the stack pointer, push 4037.9A on the stack, move 0 to EAX, negate EAX, push EAX on the stack, 3 times F5 times 0 to EAX, negate EAX, and I scroll down a bit, we push EAX on the stack, push 423C4 on the stack, get us what's on the stack for EAX, and would now run EAX. So, put the address of the following command on the stack and jump to EAX. We do not actually run this function open file mapping w, which we looked at in the last video. We jump in there. Now we are at the address 23C4, and if we would continue the program flow now, then we would go to the address that is at the point 42430. But we can get the address, which is 4 bytes long, print with px and at address 42430 and take a look. There is 2760 and then we can see what is there. Namely the string open file mapping w. The execution environment automatically includes the DLL here. This cannot be emulated and simulated here and we do not need it either. We do not even have to know what this function does in detail. For us it was important, that's why I got out here again and go back, for us it was important that the function gives a return value of zero so that we do not jump to the interrupt function. Okay. We can reset the EIP by analyzing emulate registers to change the EIP instruction pointer. And we want to set it to hex 40, 10, 28. Another important point after the function is executed, it cleans up the stack pointer. This means that it has passed parameters over the stack, namely three parameters and the value where the function should jump to after completing namely 40, 10, 28 is on the stack. So this value and three parameters. That means we have add hex 10 from the stack pointer to delete these values from memory. So we change the stack pointer stack pointer plus hex 10. So that's still interesting. We can look up into the stack with C and move there with HJKL. We are at this point and when we go up we see all the values are still here. They will stay there too until they are overwritten. This will be interesting at another point. So with C we can go back down into the area and have now pretended to have performed the function. What we will still have to do is set EAX to 0, because we want to change that as well. Now EAX is set to 0, now EAX is compared to 0, and it's actually 0. We can see that on the flag up here, where the 0 flag is set. Therefore, the next jump is not executed to 1, but only to 2. It's unconditionally anyway to 40223C and here we are. We execute the next two instructions, so we write the value hex 403727 into the register az and increment az by 1. We push 0 on the stack, push another 0 on the stack, push the value in az on the stack, hex 43728, and then we call the function load library xw. I go into more detail later on these four functions, but first we go one step further, push EAX, test EAX, EAX, and jump equal hex 402237. If we press T, we can get to the interrupt function. In order not to arrive at the interrupt function, test EAX, EAX must not trigger the conditional jump. 
logically bitwise end of two equal values always gives the value itself. In this case, jump equal can be a bit misleading. The condition is jump when the zero flag is set. Test sets the zero flag if and if only its result is zero. The result is zero if EAX was zero. Therefore, EAX and the return value of the call instruction must not be zero. The function load library xw loads the specified module into the memory of the call process and additional modules can be reloaded. The syntax has three parameters and the most important one is lplib filename. If the function completed successfully, the return value is a handle to the loaded module. If the function did not complete successfully, the return value is zero. We look at which module the function load library xw loads by showing us 32 bytes at the position hex 43728 and see here that the module ntdsap.dll is loaded. The header file of ntdsap shows that this is about Active Directory domain services, which are loaded here. It seems essential for this program to load the module ntdsap. Today we have finished the structure analysis and followed many conditional jumps to an interrupt function as well as to a loop. Afterwards we went to the Radaoli2 emulator Ezeal and examined the header of the Windows RP function load library xw. In the next part we will get to know other Windows RP functions, look at the rest of the code blocks and in particular the loop function and go down to the deepest depth of the source code. Believe me, it will be scary. See you later.